Hello, and welcome to the Catholic Passage Podcast. My name is Aaron Lorch, and I'm today's host. This podcast aims to pursue the truth, an authentic Catholic life, a deep integration of faith and reason, and a joyful community of families, raising the next generation of the Catholic faithful. Today's guest is Abigail Glass, who is the owner of Focus Gardens in Sac City, Iowa, as well as a former teacher and administrator in the Catholic school system. She also happens to have a part in Catholic Passage's origin story. I'm really excited to share our dialogue through this episode where Abby and I discuss her ties to Catholic Passage, background in education, and her business and ministry in Focus Gardens, and of course, so much more. We hope you enjoy our conversation and that it might bless you in some way. Here we go. Abby Glass, thanks for coming on the podcast. Glad to have you here. Thanks for having me. And just for the listeners, where is here? I came all the way down to meet you down at Focus Gardens. Why don't you kind of explain what that is? Focus Gardens is a wholesale retail garden center that I own with my husband in Sac City, Iowa. And we have a retail shop where we sell annuals and we also do a lot of wholesale throughout the state and into Nebraska. Okay and now maybe the more important question is who are you (laughs) and how do you fit into the origin story of Catholic Passage? You go way back with Father Feller. Uh, I'll let you kind of go from there. I do. Our paths first crossed at Kemper where we were together Um, at the same, for a few years, at the same time, I was teaching, and he was chaplain, and I think maybe within the first couple of years after we met, we found that we both had a strong interest in Catholic education, and at the time, I was getting my master's in administration, and was learning and growing a lot about education and leadership, and had the opportunity to explore my Catholic faith at a deeper level. I think one of the first conversations that I remember having with him were, was on um, Catholic documents, mm. educational, <laughs> the documents, uh, the Vatican documents on education. And that was, that was, that changed a lot for me just with the introduction of those. So I'm really grateful for that. And through then, our, we continued to work together, and I kind of like to say grow together in our passion for Catholic education, had the opportunity to work together, um, well, continuing on, and even in different places. And now, I think even now, looking back, I could tell you that um, the mission of Catholic Passage is very much a part of the desire of Father Feller to really help support lay people, teachers, parents, to help pass on the faith to their children. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's always been, I think, a great, that's been very apparent even before Catholic Passage was um, an entity. So I think it's always been there, that mission, and um, I've been lucky enough to be able to be a part of that at different levels yeah. and even at the very beginning when he was first kind of trying out ideas and where we go from here bouncing off things from you right I think we've had a conversation or two <laughs> yeah so and I'm grateful for that because I believe in this mission I think it's an important thing for me the formation of well I think a lot of it roots in my own you know, I have my own experience, so I see that reflected in Catholic Passage, and I see that mission um, alive in me or in other people, and being a witness to it, I, I definitely, you know, am happy to support it and was happy to have conversations. So when my father had mentioned that this is something he was going to start, um, 
Well, at first, I think I really wanted to be a part of it <laughs> <laughs> at a managerial level because I had so many ideas. And um, so I, but I was happy to help in any way that I could. And I've done a little bit of everything, I think, through the process, whether it was taking notes or just being present. Um, we did a retreat together. Why don't you talk about that? It was Bloom Where You Planted, right? Yeah, that was our um, plants and parenting event that we put on last Lent here at Focus Gardens. And we just made the, uh, we did a comparison of how we grow tens of thousands of different annuals and plants, and they all have different needs. And yeah, just like people. Just like people. So we made a lot of each session, there were five sessions total, one for every week of Lent, and each one just was supporting parents in how kind of showing again that comparison between raising plants and the differences, but yet the comparisons with children and what we can learn from nature as parents. So it was really, it was, it was great. I feel like the, the metaphors when it comes to plants and botanicals, I think it's kind of endless almost, right? Yeah. I think we talked about that with your farming background and then our business here and growing and blooming and continually forming and watching life Mm -hmm. evolve and being able to be a steward of that is really a blessing and to be able to inspire people if that's an application that resonates with people and we can use that I think it's beautiful in more way than one (laughs) well and whether you're a farmer like myself or whether you have a greenhouse or whether you have a small garden you could just be a parent what about, what about that? What about when you refer to a father and mother coming home and viewing their garden in front of them in their home, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, what about that? What if, what if from the title, you know, bloom where you are planted? Mm-hmm. What, if you, what if you're not seeing blooming? What's, what's wrong there? What's, what's missing? Well, there can be a lot of issues, right? You know that. Um, we're looking at many variables. Is it my lack of something, right? As the steward, as the parent, as the, the leader of my family, of my children. Um, is it something within them that I don't know? Yeah. Right. Cause we have kids and they don't come with manuals. No, <laughs> my plants do. <laughs> yeah. And you have to have a manual almost for that because you do. each seed is different, has different needs. You could overwater a plant. You could underwater it. This no. is so true. Right? I'm, I, you get what I'm throwing down? I'm here? totally getting what you're throwing down. And I, so it's easy, right? The plants are easy, but the people get a little trickier. Wouldn't it be nice to have a manual for every, a little seed packet for each person that we interact with on a daily basis? It would, but one tool, I would say, that I have been introduced to through my experience in education, I had, I was lucky enough to, um, attend a retreat with a friend of mine, Sister Elizabeth Ann, mm. who um, introduced uh, the group I was with to temperaments. Mm. Yeah. So even though our children don't come with the manual or the packet, the directions on the back, yeah. we do have some great tools, research-based tools, that we can use to just help give us a little insight when we are struggling and provide maybe some knowledge and some ways that we can communicate and help parent when there's a difference. Because, um, so for example, with the temperaments, we have, there's a book called The Temperaments God Gave Your Children. And in it, it even talks about, um, it provides a quick assessment on, you can tell what your child's temperament is. And, um, you can figure out how your temperament interacts with that temperament. Oh, sure. And is it in sync or? Well, sometimes not. Yeah. (laughs) So it gives tips and pointers. It's more about understanding, you know, looking at your children. We just assume, I think, as parents sometimes that 
um, because they're, the children are ours, they just know. We live in the same house, right? They just know what they're supposed to do. But we forget this is a unique individual made in the image and likeness of God with their own very beautiful, unique purpose Absolutely. and value and way of thinking, creativity. Before we started recording, we were, before uh, you were talking about what's right behind you there, you want to reference that those vials? Oh, the propagation. Propagation, sorry. Yeah. We had a propagation party. Yeah. <laughs> that really ties in with what you're saying right now. Yeah. It's just, um, I think one of the things I highlighted at our propagation party, we were talking about the beauty of we can look at plants and a container or a garden and look at all the different varieties that come together to make this beautiful container or um, arrangement. And yet every single one of those plants could be very different in texture, color, um, height, shape, whatever. And yet we look at that with such, and we admire it with such beauty, but sometimes then it's hard for us when we look at people Mm -hmm. and we view their differences as, oh, it's, we don't, we don't look at it the same way. No. And And it's, it's harder for us to see the beauty in those that are different from us, maybe vastly different. I totally agree. So that was one thing we just talked about. I just mentioned briefly today is, um, looking at differences in a, a way that of beauty like we do plants so that could be our kids that could be your neighbor that could be you know every human (laughs) yeah people on the street all around you yeah yeah and i you said propagation party so i don't know for the listener that might not know you or be you know as familiar with what you do here what are how often are you doing these parties these different retreats you mentioned off air that you've been continuing some of those type of things. Maybe you want to touch on that a little bit. Oh, I would love to. So after last year, Father and I had... um, So prior to this, let's see, last year would have been the first year I in January I was full-time here. Okay. So prior to that, I'd been in education. And so I called it my sabbatical year, and now I'm on year (laughs) two. And And I've really grown into loving it much more. Um, when I am able to do these classes and events where I can still educate just at a different capacity. So I think last year doing that Lenten retreat was there was really good feedback from the participants and and it, it just was really rich. And I realized then what could be. And so this early start of the year, spring, it feels like spring um, already, but we just, dis- I decided instead of doing um, another Lenten retreat, we, c- we did a holistic beautification um, events, I guess you could call it. So there are three events, one to celebrate um, well, each one connected to that holistic formation and how important it is. And so the first one was we brought in a physical therapist. Her name's Dr. Boyle, and she is amazing. She talked a lot about holistic women's health in particular. And oh, yeah, holistic. Great. Yeah, it was wonderful. And I learned a lot. So I think... There's always more to learn. Oh, all the time. And every time I do, I'm so in awe, like, oh, it's amazing. So that she really tied in everything from nutrition to movement to your body makeup and just looking at the whole person. It was really wonderful. And also her relationship with her patients Mm. and how important that is and that connection and helping them to grow and to form and while addressing many issues that women face. And so that, that was um, our first event. And the second was we did a paint by numbers class and, or event where you could purchase paint by numbers kits and spend three hours out in our greenhouse in February um, when the weather's supposed to be stormy and yep. <laughs> cold and um, just enjoy the solitude. That was the focus of that event was to really just be. Yep. Just be there in the silence. Yep. 
and in, in a in a very noisy world and full of distractions. It was just an opportunity for people to be in a warm place um, of silence and solitude. And um, I think I said, hopefully the masterpiece is both on your canvas and in your heart. Ooh, so, I like that. Yeah, it was great. So great. I, I hope it's just these small experiences that help make something big in somebody's life. And maybe you just never know how the Holy Spirit's at work. You know, I like to open yeah. the minds and hearts and just say, this is what, I, I'm going to just be your servant and do what I can do and the gifts you've given me and share that and hope that, you know, well, hope, I know that whoever, always, I always have faith that whoever attends or whoever, you know, comes through that door, it's the Holy Spirit is readily at work. So. Yeah, you're just opening the door and bringing them in, and the Holy Spirit takes it from there. Yeah, literally, the yeah. doors to the greenhouse. Yeah. <laughs> in, the, in the nice warm, and it was beautiful. That event was, it, there were um, some people who came by themselves. A couple of friends came. One pair of friends said nothing, and the other pair of friends just sat and chatted quietly the whole time. It was just, it was really special. One was a mother and her two twin daughters, um, it, that, that was, it was really great. So then on the flip side, part of holistic, right, is yeah. community. So that spurred this propagation party and it wasn't so much to, yeah, we learned a little bit about propagation. I am not an expert and I made sure that that was a disclaimer that I shared with people today, but it was more about meeting new people, gathering in community supporting belonging yep. and how important that is again in our world today to just be together yeah. and enjoy something that everyone enjoys and learning from one another and people contributed and um, we're having conversations. It was, it was, it was really nice. So the purpose, yeah, everyone took home some plants and a propagation station and, hoping that the Holy Spirit works in rooting all those for those people so they can have some new plants. And, um, but the, the neat thing about today was bringing the people together. Yeah. In community. Yeah. Off air before we started recording, we were talking about, you know, community is in God mm -hmm. and you were, you know, mentioning about the, the Henry now and, you know, and that was awesome literature that you've read from him. I don't know if you want to share any of that or not, but we could go a whole podcast episode. Oh, on that, but. Ooh, it's one of my favorite books. You should see the tabs I have in that. Um, we were talking earlier about, I love to tab books. There's lots of good there. Um, there's a quote in that book. It's called Community, and it's a collection of a lot of his works focused around that topic of building community. And at one point, and I, I can't remember which one of the writings it is, he just makes the comment that um, God is you can God is not one person. You know, we cannot find God in just one person. We can't yeah. put all our eggs in one basket with one person, um, another human. But God is in all of us. Yeah. You know, made in his image and likeness. So all of us together to come into community, then we get these we get these beautiful pieces. And the more we come together with that sharing and seeing one another in that um through that lens, I think the more we can start to again going back to accepting those differences, but then okay, that's different, but this is so beautiful. And I think when we get people together in a community, it just highlights it kind of like those plants in the planner, right? Yeah. And so you might not think that that could go together, but once you do and it starts to grow together and some of those things intertwine and bloom and come together, you go, wow, that is beautiful. The beauty is expanded upon, but there's also even just the strength in the numbers, I guess, you know, whether it's a field, like as a farmer, I can put one single corn plant out in that gigantic field and what's going to happen 
it's going to be kind of ugly. It might even die. It might have weeds around it that might come in. Same thing in your garden or in a large plant or in a greenhouse, but you surround it with other plants. They don't have to even be the exact same plant either. Mm -hmm. And not only do you, do they grow better? It's more beautiful, but it's also protected and, and it can bloom, bloom better, right? Absolutely. Strength in numbers from that. Lots of great, um, again, examples in nature that we can learn from, right? Yeah. About how to live and embracing the beauty of difference. Yeah. Whether it's in your home or in your garden or at your work or, you know, at teaching. I mean, I taught for almost 20 or was in education for almost 20 years and you know, you think of a classroom of, I did middle school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved it. I could do that. Oh, I loved it. God knew. I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. But God knew you were meant to be there. Oh, he has a good sense of humor, doesn't he? Yeah. Like I was, this is just, you know, they always say if you want to, you know, that saying, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. Uh-huh. And he, he's done that to me numerous times. Make so sure to write them in pencil, so too. Funny. Yeah. Give God the eraser. I've just stopped making plans, Aaron. <laughs> I've just stopped completely, and I just listen now. That's been a journey all in itself. But just thinking of a classroom full of kids and their differences. And I think so part of me, maybe I'm, I haven't always been able to articulate it as I can now with some of the help of Henry now and some of the, you know, my journey of just learning and growing. But I think I've always noticed we are not the same. We don't bring the same. We shouldn't be treated the same um, as far as our needs, right? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think it's, it's embracing that at all levels and seeing that in, again, whether it's in a classroom or in a home. Or, but I think where it's really, where it really grew for me or I guess I, where I realized it was definitely in the classroom. Mm with kids. And then every year you get a new batch, right? A new group. And they're different from the last group. And the way they interact as a group is different as they do individually. And you just, it's a, it's a lesson in itself in education. It's like, as you have that greenhouse out there, if you just would decide that every year I'm going to have a completely different batch of plants. I'm going to have to reread the seed labels. I'm going to have to relearn how I'm supposed to you know, plant these, how, how, what depth, how much water, how much nutrients, because they all have different needs. They all have different ways they need to grow um, to become beautiful. And you got to see that in the same way in the classroom or as a parent. Yeah, I'm going to shift a little bit, Aaron, with that and go to the education because this is you know, near and dear to my heart. And I can't, I can't say enough how important relationships are yes. in the classroom. I think that's where you start to learn their instructions that they have that come with them and making sure that you take the time. Sometimes in education, we are so content minded and um, we have these objectives and these standards we have to meet. We have all these things to do. And so we do and we don't give ourselves that time to really help um, build relationships. I know now there's a lot more emphasis on that. You yeah. hear that a lot in our world. And, yeah. and I'm glad that there's um, a conversation started about that. And there's much more evidence and research to, to show that how important it is. But I think that goes back to our community conversation, right? And our holistic awareness and that we, these aren't just students in your desks or in your seat. These are human beings who um, we have the opportunity to help form for a very short time in their life yeah, and it's special. And so I think if you look at it through that lens and knowing that it's not going to be perfect, they're not going to be perfect, but you have the opportunity to get to know them and, you know, recognize the gifts that God gave them yeah, and help to support them in that. That's pretty amazing. It is. Yeah. It's a, it's an honor. It's been an honor. Yeah to be able to be a part of that in somebody's life. So, yeah. When I grew up in our small town public school, I don't think that at that time, and I'm not even that old, but I don't remember feeling that same level of importance put on, and maybe that was from my perspective as a student too, 
at, at that age. Maybe it was being thought of, but I did, my eyes were opened when I saw through my wife in the classroom, like, oh my gosh, she's not just it's not just a checklist of I got to teach the A, B, C's. I got to teach one, two, threes. This little checklist. It's oh my gosh, she's she is building this relationship with them, and it's not just the the job of the guidance counselor, if you will, to to make a relationship with a student. It's every single one of those staff members, you know. And it's amazing for me to see how close she is with some of these these kids. Like they see her as like another parental figure in a sense, but also as a friend, Mm -hmm. maybe even more so, you know, that way. Yeah, I think how, I I think just like the kids are all different, so are we, right, as leaders, as educators. And so I think that's a whole lesson in itself that's great for children is, um, so middle school, right, we were departmentalized, so they they went to different classrooms for different subjects. But what a lesson in life to learn to adjust and adapt to oh, yeah. from Mrs. Glass to Mrs. or Mr. And have to learn that we, too, are very different. Um, I think uh, our expectations sometimes, even as children, is you're thinking one thing that a teacher should be. And I think that relationship, what that aids and helps is when, you, when they can see you as a human being yeah. with your own likes and you get to share that and... Um, down to one thing I learned that was really powerful in developing those relationships was being vulnerable. You know, if I had a bad day and I, I showed it, <laughs> I had no problem apologizing yeah. to the kids. That was really important. And saying, you know, I'm really sorry. You guys, I'm really sorry. I'm crabby today. I'm not crabby today. And every time it never feels, I mean, there's always somebody's like, yeah. But um, <laughs> at the end of the time or the day, in unison, almost every time they go, it's okay, Mrs. Glass, we love you, or, you know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's sweet. It's really sweet. And that's when, you know, we have to model. I was just going to say, that's a great witness for them. We have to. And there's so much power in that or, you know, influence in, in that modeling, right? So yeah. modeling your vulnerability, um, appropriately, right? Of course, of course. <laughs> um, so in, in the context that's appropriate for your, for your relationship with the children. But yeah, I think the more that we can do that for them, the more then you build the trust. And with appropriate boundaries, they also start to look at and learn about love. Yeah, yeah. And that it's not always about letting you do whatever you want. I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to push you. Um, I'm, I'm going to have these expectations from you. And even though I think people might say I have a high tolerance, and I really do, I'm not too strict, I guess. I just, I never really felt like I had to be. Um, and I like communication, and I like my busy classroom, and especially when they're on task, right, and completing things. But it can become very special. And then you watch them not only believe in this culture you're creating in the classroom, but believing in themselves, believing in what they're capable of being able to do. And I don't know, holistically thinking about formation, it becomes all encompassing, right? Yeah. I was just thinking whether if you're not a teacher, even if you're just a parent and you look at, okay, how can I be a great witness for my kids and so they don't just see me as the parent. It's like that title. Like you were talking about, same way with the teacher. You know, a young kid might be coming to school every single day and looking, oh, they're not even like regular people in a sense. You know, they're not a human. They don't have their ups and downs. They don't have their weaknesses. They don't have, they probably don't even have interest. All they care about is school, right? They're just a teacher. And if you get that in your mind, I mean, for a different conversation, how do we look at priests that way, right? Sure. Um, You know, the tradition of like, okay, they're just a priest. They're not even like a regular person, but, but that's a whole nother conversation. But like with, as a parent, these kids are looking at their mom and dad. They're just mom. They're just dad. Mm -hmm. No, they are humans just like you. They are individuals. And and how do you witness that and, and allow yourself to be vulnerable and share yourself again to within reason, but it can be a great witness. I... I have done that I th- with our own kids, 
And I've had struggles um, in the past couple of years, things that I have just personal, a personal journey. And I know I, it changed who I had been, you know, maybe prior to them as this, um, oh, what do you want to say? Your stereotypical parent, right? Like what you're kind of talking about. Okay. Yeah. And so I was probably just mom or whatever. And I think through this process of my own personal journey and learning, growing and lots of healing, which I'm grateful for, I learned how important it is to model all the things that you just said to your children. And I remember a specific time I was um, with my two girls. We have four children, so it was, but I two boys and two girls. And I was with our girls who are only two years apart. And I can't, I can't remember how the conversation started, but I, well, I probably had a, a low moment <laughs> and took it out on them or something. But, and I remember, but I do remember how important this is. And again, this is kind of, I felt the Holy Spirit at work because I had ran across on social media a post about this father who had, um, he didn't apologize to his kids. He asked them for forgiveness. Mm. And I remember going, okay. <laughs> and so I think when that event had happened, I remember just that coming back to me. And so I remember looking at both the girls in their face and I said, we, I, I, about what had ever happened, I said, you know, I know I have not been um, quite the same and you know, mom has been struggling about this. And I go, but can you forgive me? And will you help me? And, um, you know, they of course both said yes, but there was, it was a moment like mm. full of a lot of, um, mm, it was just something powerful. Yeah. And so from, and after I was able to be vulnerable enough to do that with, you know, share that with my children and experience the moment, then it has been easier to do moving forward. Cause it's not, you know, we, we have this idea that we are supposed to know everything and help them. And, yeah. um, but going back to community, our homes are communities, right? Yeah. Our homes are these little cultures and not that it's their, my expectation that they take care of their mother, but I want them to also, they're already there witnessing everything, right? Yeah. They're knowing what's going on. But are they on the outside just looking at it or are you going to invite them in exactly. to your heart? Exactly. You know, and, and I was just thinking the difference there when you say, oh, I'm sorry about this. It seems like there's a distance there. You might say to someone, oh, sorry, I stubbed your toe. I'm sorry I did this. I'm sorry I did that. No, can you forgive me? Mm-hmm. Can you help me out? I'm inviting you in, and it's more relational that way. And restorative. Uh, yeah, and there you go. Boom. And that's and that that's another area that we can have another podcast about because that'll take a whole a whole episode. But restorative engaging in, you know, I see I'm I'm a, a big fan of restorative practices and and have been gone to different trainings and. I see how powerful that is, but I also watch um, the spirit of Christ in those practices of restoring and repairing and healing and what it can mean, those words of forgiveness and for one another, right? To model Christ in those moments where we get to say, will you forgive me and listen? And I think there's so much misunderstanding in when there's um, any kind of conflict and we sometimes don't have the opportunity to stop and have those conversations to say, I, I need you to hear me so that you can, help, I, you can understand. You don't have to agree with me, but I, I just need you to hear me. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I think we just are so busy that we don't give those opportunities to have those conversations. And they're hard. Yeah. And they take practice. And they're not easy. But I think if you are lucky enough or blessed enough to start to build that culture either within your family or with friends it the payoff in the end is 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 truly love to love because if you can help somebody through those moments and and be there to listen and try to understand the best you can and look at our worldview right of being broken and Mm. fallen the parts of the fall that that we all um, are affected by. We need to help each other through that. Yeah. It's easy to judge. It's easy to place blame and to just move on. 
um, you know, going back to an, even an education, you know, how many times do we either suspend a kid or give them a detention, but we never talk about it. Yeah. It's just like, this is the consequence, you're done. And then I think that's where the shame starts to, you know, fester. And the, um, instead of it become a form, becoming a formational opportunity where we can say, hey, yes, this is part of, this is part of our story, right? Our worldview. This is just part of, of how we are as human beings. But I'm gonna ha- it, it doesn't define you. Um, you are good. And this is just part of that. And we're going to help you. We're going to support you through this. Yeah. How much good does the detention do compared to if you're focusing more on what's going to come after from that, if we can form? Well, and I always tell people I'm close to when I have these conversations, because I like to talk about this topic. Um, it's easy to give a detention. Yes. Yeah. That's easy, that's right? Easy to thing. throw the book at someone or put the hammer down. That's easy. That's not formational though either. No, and that's not easy. It's yeah. not. We know parenting's not easy. No. Um, teaching is not easy. Anytime we are engaging in formation, it is so hard. And but you can it can be an easy job if we just say, here's 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 what's gonna happen and that's it and moving on. And I think when I went to school, that was very much and even before. Oh, it's been happening for a long time. <laughs> um, it's, and it's, it's unfortunately kind of the institution now. This is just what's been accepted. And I guess that's where some of my love for Catholic education has really developed was watching this opportunity that we have in Catholic schools to really promote holistic formation mm. and put the faith first and to say, this is our truth, though. This is, this is who we are. This isn't just something that's a buzzword right now, restorative practices. This is, this is deeper than that. This is, we can find the goodness in that practice, but we can tie that and connect that back to our truth yeah. and to our faith. And I think if we fail to do that in all the practice, if we don't look at every practice that we adopt in our schools and say, is this the best for children and how, especially our Catholic schools, because we can, right? Yep. How is this connected to our truth? I think that's a big disservice if we can't do that and if we're not doing that. Because, you know, it, it's like any other, I don't know, vocation or out there or, you know, whatever. Um, there's buzzword. There's always things changing and evolving. What's the new, right? Yeah. What's the up and coming? And I don't think they're bad. I just think that it always, we need to make sure that we keep that worldview in mind and our truth in mind and make sure we evaluate it through that lens first and, and be very, very careful um, that no matter what we adopt, it's always helping the formation of our children and to love Christ you know, to really deepen that love through those processes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you're talking about the opportunity that you have in Catholic education to focus on some of those other things besides just the ABCs, one, two, threes, et cetera, et cetera, something that we were talking off air was not just the, you're doing these things. These are the, this is the checklist of the things we need to teach you. But what about the why behind it? Right. And I think that's where you can go deep and you can get into the why. But I think the checklist and the living and the model, that can happen then in the public school too. I mean, yeah. I don't, I mean, our, our children go to a public school currently. And so I just really feel that it can be, it, this same principle can be for all children in any educational system. It's truly modeling and living it. So if let's say you're a Christian, a Catholic or a Christian, and these truths, right, our worldview, this Christian worldview that we all, our story, right? There's no reason that can't be lived and modeled instead of just, we're going to do these things. Yeah. And it's not just something that you're modeling in the classroom either. It's, it's in the home. Yeah. It's yeah. a way of, it's a way that um, I think it's choice. Yeah. We have to choose to do it. Choose to live it. Choose to live it. Yeah. And we know it's hard, right? Society is not on our side. <laughs> There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of influence. There's a lot of people telling you what you should be doing. Um, 
And so to, I just had this conversation with a good friend, um, how anymore you really feel like you're um, swimming against the current when you're trying to, when you have this worldview in mind, right? You're looking through this lens at the, at life. And as parents, it's, it's not the norm. And, um, I think we, we both had just said, it's okay to say no to some things that Mm. aren't in alignment. Um, I, I, I mean, I could go into that all night too about parenting and, and I'm not, it has nothing to do with anyone else or judgment on what other people choose to do. It's about what's important and valued in our home. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's a misconception when you start to go against the grain that people think, oh, who are they, right? Or yeah. what are they doing when, and if you're, if you're strong enough and if you're faith-filled enough to know that um, I'm confident in what we're doing, it gets easier. Yeah. It gets easier to just make those decisions. And, and when your little family community is strong and, and that you start to watch that formation working in all of you, then you, you, it becomes, it just becomes your norm. Yeah. And, and I have, I have watched that in our family. And that is something I'm really proud of that our husband and I have, my husband and I have done with our kids and I, I see it in our kids and it hasn't been in big things. It's just been in little things. Little changes, little things we've adopted or decided to do or not to do. It's, there's no, there's no book for this either, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I th- I'm really, I mean, on the, this is just one very small example, and, and probably lots of families do this. So I don't know that it's any special, or, you know, special. But when I take the kids to school every morning, we pray together. We have about a two minute drive. So we get to, I mean, it's full of spontaneous prayer. I always lead it. And I remember when we first started this, cause this was a different, this was different. Yeah. Cause I have never, I mean, we, we've drove in the car together before going to school. Um, but this is different that I know I'm dropping them. I'm not staying, I'm dropping them off. So my mindset in all fairness, is in a different place than I'm rushing to work, right? To yeah, do these sure. things. So that's a blessing in itself. But we just, we do, we pray for their peers and we pray for um, learning and growing into who God made them to be, that they get to discover their gifts and, and that the people around them, their teachers and their peers help aid in that. And, and we pray for just very quickly. And then we always end with, you know, uh, rope prayer. So the Our Father, the Hail Mary. And I remember when we first started this, they were kind of like, oh, you know, and this was my kids. This is just, you know, a few months ago to the point where now, as soon as they, okay, let's pray. And they all will immediately get ready. Mm. Say, you know, we do the sign of the cross together now in unison. Anymore. They're not doing the groans anymore. So it comes, you just have to keep going. And um, again, that takes a couple minutes. Yeah. And we don't, and you know what? I don't remember every time. So I'm not superwoman. I did. I don't, we don't. Sometimes I, sometimes we are yelling on the way, on the way to school and somebody's <laughs> upset. That's life, right? That's, That's real. That's life. And so that happens too. But when we have those moments where we get to, where that happens and we engage in prayer just on our way to school, two minutes, it's pretty special. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful witness for them too, you know, saying, hey, we're, this is how we're starting our day. You know, right before we're going to school, but we're going to begin with this. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of gratitude. A lot of gratitude. We always started off with the gratitude. So the, the very first part is thanking God for this beautiful day and the sunshine. We've had a lot of it. I was so say. it's so good and um, makes us feel good. So there's been a lot of gratitude. So I think that's important too. But yeah, it's been pretty, pretty awesome. Now the, the, the key thing is when the weather turns bad again, if it does, maybe it's just going to be spring here, is having that gratitude in the gloomy, you know, mm-hmm. and not just weather-wise either, but in the gloomy days. We, that's a hard thing for us adults too, for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I was just thinking of, that's something a couple of the gals on our Lenten series with Catholic pastors, when they're talking about trust, um, my wife actually was one of them, she is talking about in her video that, hey, you know, when the weather is so nice out and, and even in my, in my life, in my heart, 
uh, it's nice and sunny. It's so much easier to just say, Hey, I'm, I'm super thankful for all this stuff. But what about when we're in the doldrums and not going into that, but when we have, you've spoken on some of that stuff too, when you're going through the lows of that roller coaster up and down far, far, far from those highs, you don't have a, a bird's eye view anymore up at the cart at the top. You're not looking out there and seeing all the beauty out there you're down at the bottom and you don't even know if you can get back up. What about having gratitude at that point? You know, I read, well, I've had some of those times yeah. Aaron. <laughs> and I, I, I worked really hard through it and still, still do. And I think the one thing, one thing that stuck to me and I, I think this is really powerful. Well, two things that had, that I've experienced. One was I had read somewhere that somebody said, you have to choose joy it's a choice yeah you have to choose it and I think that's where the practice of gratitude so then I'm going okay well how do I do that when I'm here yep and it is it's it's a practice it's I think sometimes with our faith we just assume that you you watch other people who have it you go how do they get that (laughs) you know you go how do they have that I remember meeting a very young woman this was just a couple years ago in her very early 20s and I was in awe of her faith I thought how do I get that (laughs) yeah and I'm 20 years older than her and she (laughs) seemed to have it all figured out and after listening to her story it wasn't you know she 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 was definitely much further along than I was in my early 20s (laughs) that's a whole nother podcast to her and maybe not for Catholic Passage okay because that was a whole different time but um no she uh she definitely seemed to have it all figured out. And I thought I was just, it was beautiful. And yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just, I remember being really in awe of that. Yeah. I've met people like that too before. And it's almost like they got a glow around them and and it's magnetic too. Mm -hmm. Like they draw you to them. They draw other people around them. It's like this magnetic force and you just can't help smiling when they're smiling, enjoying life a little more. You know, you're wondering, how do I get that yeah. glow? You know, yeah. my skin doesn't look that good. I don't have a glow coming off my skin like that. Well, how do I get this? What are they using? You know? And I think that's, we, that can be, I, I say, do that with caution, yeah, right? Exactly. Because my story is still my story and my feelings, just like, you know, when you said the, the women on the for your Lenten thing. We're talking about that. One really important thing that I've learned is that you're not going to run away from those feelings. (laughs) They're still going to be there. there. And it's really important to, to give them that space, um, without, I think where the gratitude comes in and the hope, hope is another really big, powerful one that knowing that this is, this is part, um, of what I, I have right now but I have hope that it's going to get better. And I think, and I'm, I, I can admit there were some times that things, I was like, it's never going to get better. <laughs> it's hopeless. And it felt that way. And I think I had to learn to give myself, not shame myself for feeling that way, to recognize how normal that was to feel that way. Yeah. And to give myself that space and time to feel those feels, so to say. And then recognize um, that, and that was a process for me to allow myself to feel those things Mm -hmm. so that I could almost, I don't know how else to say it, like, okay, I'm going to feel this and then I'm going to move on. But I gave it some space and that has been one strategy that has really worked for me. And then that helps to, because you do, then eventually you come out of it and you go, okay, yeah, things do get better. Things are better. And you you slow down a little bit and you see that that hope that you had, you start to see that in the things around you Yep. become alive. Right. That's right. And in the moment and there's, it be just, it's becomes beautiful. And so it's a process. It doesn't, it's not something you get, you know, like we no. were going back and saying, how do I get that? It's not, it's, it's, it's a process. It's even a journey, really, you know, going up the hill, the walk, it's a journey. And one thing that you were saying there, it was really making me think of my own story and where I've been in really, really low parts where I'm seeing sort of an absence of hope. 
it's like just pure hopelessness. And then I'm having all these other feelings and having to recognize eventually where are they coming from? Where are those feelings of frustration, anger, all the hurt feelings, whatever have you, the despair, Mm -hmm. where are they coming from? And then that little glimmer of hope that I can see there, the, you know, the little light peeking past the crack of the door that I can open up. Where is that hope coming from? Who is the source of our hope, right? Mm -hmm. And reminding yourself of that. Yeah. And I think for me, part of my journey and going back to that Henry Nouwen book about God, right? Not one person can be that for you. So we yeah. talk about being attached to things and and um, how we can become. So I mean, my relationship with my mother was, I, I mean, I had a really good relationship with her and she passed away. And I recognized how much I depended on her, mm. right? And which is healthy. We, you, you, it's great to have a great parent, but when they're gone... And you feel kind of, you start to, those feelings of, you kind of go, wait a minute, now what? Now what happens? And I don't know that it happened right away, but when, when the waters were troubled <laughs> in my life and I recognized I didn't have her anymore, it just, it kind of upset my, my inner being, right? And I didn't know what to do. And, and so I think it was through a lot of, a lot of events and recognizing the one person I wasn't really going to, who I really needed to, that could give me the most was God. Yeah. And that, that was the journey. Yeah. Still is. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful that I got there and that I know now, but I, even looking back a, along the course of my life, I just think he has always been there. Then it became clear. Once I've, you know, now that I'm here and I recognize how much he works and how much he loves me and Um, how much when I receive that I can love other people but watching how that's been a part of my life this like forever and I can look back to certain events and go how did I get through that yeah (laughs) how did how am I where I'm at today and his graces have always been there it was me who needed to get there right it was it was finally and it's not that I never wanted it or didn't desire it but I had to learn and grow and I had to be intentional about it. So when we talk about forming as parents and as people or as educators or whatever, to be able to be there to help others, I think it's, it's really focusing on you as an individual to receive that, that love first yeah, and recognize that you are good and you are beloved. And that always puts a smile on my face to say that and to really feel that. It's one thing to just say it. And it's another thing to feel it and believe it. And I think sometimes we're our, our own worst enemies, right? Yeah. In that, in that process. And being affected by the fall and our wounds and our brokenness and, and that of others too that have affected us, um, it, can be, it can be desolate. It can feel like despair. And where is it? Um, but that's the graces. I think you... You, the more you search, the more you will find, right? Yeah. And I think the more God makes it very clear when you surrender that and you find that in your heart. And for me at the time, it was, I had nowhere else to go, right? And I had no one person. So not one person was going to be able to give everything to me. And I remember feeling so frustrated, like, why can't they just give this to me? Why can't they fix it? <laughs> why can't they help me? And they, can't. they couldn't. And I remember how powerful that was when I, I think I just remember the time when I literally just surrendered. Yeah. And it was, it was beautiful. Why do you think it's so hard for us to surrender? I, th- you know, I don't know. I think there, c- it depends. I think it depends on who you are and there's so many different reasons, right? I think, cause I think it depends on your personality. I think it depends on your position. I think it depends on your environment, your experiences. It can, lots of things, right? Um, for me, I think I thought I could handle things. I didn't need yourself. I, I knew God, right? I wasn't not 
a believer. I've always been a believer. I've always believed in God. I've always, you know, did my checklist as, as but a you had Catholic, your plan right? And you were following it though, right? And I had a plan. And I yeah. think what was really hard for me is I even thought I was doing God's will. Yep. I thought this was what he had set out for me. And maybe it very well was. But then when that was disrupted and I was going, wait a minute, I was really enjoying this. And I was enjoying it because I thought I was doing what you wanted me to do. And so when that was um, taken away, yeah, that was very hard for me. And so, but again, in a, in a sense, that was almost an attachment, right? I was putting a lot of my identity into one thing when I have just coming here, making that shift from education to owning this greenhouse and working here still on my sabbatical. <laughs> um, I found that my gifts don't, aren't defined by just one to be put in one place. So it doesn't, it's not just in the classroom. The gifts can be used anywhere. That's right. And when you start to, oh, geez, I, I don't know how to explain it. When you start to think of, of it in that way that, because, you know, we do talk about vocation. And we talk about, and I always felt, since my first memories were playing school. So for me, I always just thought education was where I belonged. And so, and, and I'd always been in education. I tried to get out of education. I couldn't. I tried to get out of Catholic education and I couldn't. So I just thought God really wants me here. Yeah. He is making this happen. And I do believe when I was, he was. Exactly. Right? He was allowing that to happen. Plans can change and we get comfortable. We think that, okay, I'm following God's will. I'm yes. following his plan. That means I'm going to do it for the rest of my life. No, not necessarily. It, it might oh, no. be a week. <laughs> it might be years. And we become very surprised when, or fearful, when all of a sudden it's like, okay, time, knock, 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 time to switch plans up. Oh, no, 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 no. That can't be right. Mm -hmm. And I think the hardest was because I, I was enjoying it so much. And it was so life-giving for me. And, um, but there was so much to learn in that process when God said, oh, we're going to change this up a little bit. Not just a little bit, a lot of bit. A lot of bit. Ooh. And um, that's, now I can look back and I'm so grateful for that. I'm, I've, the amount of growth I've had holistically, spiritually especially, and to deepen that relationship with God, you know what? It, it was all worth it. I don't, and, and for once in my life, it's, and now I kind of go, ah, huh. because somebody asked me this the other day. They're like, well, what do you want? I go, you know what's really funny? For once in my life, I don't know. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with just being where I'm at. Whatever, I trust that God is going to pave that path. Instead of me saying, here's the path God's paving for me. <laughs> and still defining it. I've done that before too. Right? Like, oh no, this is totally God's path. I know. Instead of that, I, I am just truly in the moment and I trust whatever comes. Yeah. Whether it's good or bad, even. I will get through it. I think at first thought, the whole idea of surrendering completely like that is, is super scary, but it's also like, surely that doesn't work. Surely mm -hmm. there's... All the, all the fears and, 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 and thoughts about that is the first gut feeling, right? Mm -hmm. And then when you actually do it, you realize that how freeing it actually is. <gasps> the freedom. Right? That's a really good point, Aaron. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, you're like, I can never go back. Right? When you experience that freedom and you go, no, this is a good place to be. Especially for somebody who has always been a planner. And I think we talked about this previously. Yeah, we're both. Right? planner types. Yeah. And, and, and even in education, you're trained this way. You know, you're trained to plan your whole year out. Look at your curriculum. Where are you going to yep. do for, for these nine months? Where are you planning? What are you planning? When are you planning? How are you planning? Um, you know, <laughs> elementary teachers plan their minutes, yeah. right? Down to the minute of the day. That's so structured. Except when you leave the classroom, all of a sudden life says, eh, eh, you can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's thrown me into a lot of things that have made me uncomfortable, roles even here, you know, that I never have done before. Sure. And I'm a learner, thank goodness. So I, I mean, I've learned it, but it's been hard. And, you know, 
I'm, but I'm, I'm grateful for those experiences too. And whatever, however God's allowing this to happen and me to grow in these areas, I, they, I just know, I trust that there's something ahead that it will, that where I need to apply it or use it or whatever. Or maybe it's not, maybe it's just in this moment and maybe I'll be back in education someday. I don't know, but none of that is as worrisome to me yeah. or, um, obsessive as maybe it was. Because you've allowed that, you've let that go. You have that freedom now. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good place to be. So I hope, I hope it's like this for a long time. You'll find out. We will. Well, Abby, is there anything else that we should know about this place? You want to put a bid in for, if people oh, are interested okay. to, I'm not trying to like do a whole advertisement thing, but if anybody's in the area, they want, they're interested in coming to one of your retreats or your propagation parties, Sure. Uh, you want to try to, you guys have a website or a phone number or something to share. We do. We reach out to you. Um, we're on, well, we have a website, focusgardens.com and it's P-H-O-C-A-S. P-H. This is probably, yeah, cause this gets kind of, um, sometimes confused um and it's so why is that maybe just say that okay first. well and i don't i'm we're probably not even saying it right but it, it could be focus i i'm not quite sure but i see the sign up there but everybody else listening cannot see that so yeah. why don't you explain so that? when we first purchased this we were trying to figure out names i said well let's look at the saints what are who are the saints of you know gardening or and so we get, of course farming a saint isidore right mm-hmm. Isn't that saint that's isidore? right Yep. And I was like, oh, is it, is it our garden? It just doesn't roll off the it tongue didn't. as good as so I picked, focus gardens. Yeah, with a PH to really, just to Throw really them. confuse people. <laughs> yeah, so we went with that one. And I think it was at the end of the day, the story and the simplicity of his story. And what is St. Focus's story? Well, I love to tell it. So I'll tell you, Aaron. Good. And the listeners. So St. Focus was a hermit. Um, I think lived during the Diocletian era and he grew a garden and took care of people. Very simple life. And so lived by just very simply, but also helped people in need and was a Christian, you know, believed in Christ. And so the Roman soldiers came, they had heard that there was this, this Christian focus and they stumbled upon his hermitage and went found him and said, um, I think it, they said it, the, it was the, the end of the night. And so the city was closing like they, I'm assuming this yep. is what happens. Yep. And so he, they came to his door and they're like, we're looking for focus. Can you take, you know, us to him? And I always laugh. I said, they didn't have Facebook then. So you couldn't like uh-huh. stalk them ahead of time or see pictures. So they had no idea. And he said, you know what? It's late. I will take you to them in the morning. In the meantime, you can stay here. Mm. Fully aware of yeah. what they were there to oh, do. Oh, yeah. Fed them. Was very hospitable, yeah. right? Yeah. And even knowing... Their intentions. Th- his, their intentions and his outcome. And so there were a, different, a couple different stories on, on what happened after that. One was that he went out and he prayed and he dug at his own grave because he knew what was going to happen. Another resource had said that he went and made sure that all the people he had been caring for would be continued. He kind of left instructions on who was going to need some help with other people. Wow. And in the morning when the soldiers had said, you know, hey, thank you. You've been, you know, great. Can you take us to him? And he said, I am who you're looking for. And they said, oh, but you've been so kind and hospitable. We can't, we can't just say you don't believe in Christ. Just... Just say, we're going to walk out this door. All you have to do is say, this never happened. You just, just say. Yeah, it's just so easy, right? It's so easy. easy. And he said, I can't do that. You're going to have to carry out your orders. And they did. And they beheaded him. And that's that. It was just a simple, I, I, simple. In that moment, you think that wasn't simple. No. Right? But I think... We hear other saint stories, and there's a lot of miracles, and there's lots of these these grandiose things that had happened, and I and I I think that's beautiful in itself too, and truly a miracle, and a mystery, but just the simplicity of that story of just loving Christ, 
and being able to live it yeah is pretty powerful so that's where we got the name i said no and so we customer service was really important to us so when we saw hospitality and kindness yeah we knew that was something we felt was maybe a dying art in 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 business and so like everybody even our kids if they're out here and they're helping anyone who comes they immediately greet them yeah. it's just something that we we feel um, everyone should feel welcome when they come here and um, we still carry people's things out we help take things out to the car if people need help and um greet hospitality them. And lots kindness, of hospitality first and foremost. yeah that's great yeah bringing beauty to the whole world that's through right. hospitality and kindness and this is a beautiful place Thank you. Okay, so back to the original question. You have a website. Website, social media, Facebook, and Instagram. All at Focus Gardens PH. Yes. Okay. PH. <laughs> o C A S. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, Thanks thank for you having so much. me, Aaron. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this was nice visiting. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Catholic Passage Podcast, and we hope that it blesses you. Please check out our show notes for a reflection takeaway, as well as more info on Catholic Passage. We aim to support parents and educators as they pass on the Catholic faith and way of life to their children and students. To find out more about what we offer, or how you might collaborate with us, visit catholicpassage.com. Most importantly, you can support us through your prayers. We'll be praying for you. Please pray for us.